Good evening, everyone. We'd like to thank you for joining our uh, student and family webinar. My name's Mike Scanlon from the Department of Marketing and Communications. Uh, I'm an alum of the class of 06, uh, and I've been very involved in the COVID-19 task force. Uh, and you're gonna hear tonight from uh, several uh, leaders on campus who are also involved in the task force um, we're going to cover a variety of topics uh, and do our very best to get to as many of your questions as possible. Uh, if we don't get to your question, rest assured, uh, we are continuing to monitor the COVID response at jcu.edu inbox, uh, and we will uh, reply to you uh, via email. Uh, we'll also be adding additional FAQs to jcu.edu slash 2021 plan. Uh, that's where you can find uh, all of our information regarding testing, contact tracing, quarantine, isolation, and our health and safety protocols. Um, you are also uh, welcome to submit your questions in real time this evening using the Q&A function. I will be monitoring that throughout. And following the presentation, uh, we will get to as many of those questions as we can. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Steve Herbert, who is the Provost and Academic Vice President at John Carroll, who uh, has some words of introduction. Thank you, Mike. Um, and I add my own welcome to everyone out there. Thank you for joining us on this evening. I'd like to begin tonight with uh, two notes, a note of gratitude and a note of excitement. Um, gratitude. I'd like to express gratitude uh, on behalf of everyone involved in this for all those John Carroll staff members who you will hear from tonight and see but also for the countless professionals that are backing them up that you will not see uh, from tonight or hear from tonight. Their tireless work in bringing them back to campus, you will see in evidence tonight. The planning and safety precautions that we have and the, the work that we've done organizing a campus experience that's strong, even though it will be different from what we have been used to in the past, I think you'll see on evidence tonight. I'd like to express uh, gratitude for our faculty as well. Some of you students have experienced this over the last fall, but for all the tireless and creative work that they've done through the summer, the fall, and this, and this spring semester to reinvent their teaching styles, to adapt the content for their courses and integrate technology into the courses that have existed for uh, quite a while to deliver the kind of quality education that you expect from a John Carroll experience. There've been blips, yeah, especially early on in the in last spring, but we've learned together and our faculty have come a long way and put a lot of work into making the kind of experience in their classroom that they're proud of and that you will benefit from. So I'd like to express gratitude for all the work of our faculty. And finally, I'd like to express gratitude for you and your parents for your patience with us as we work through the challenges and had to accommodate um, difficulties that none of us could see coming but we've adapted and been flexible for your willingness to persevere through both loss, personal loss, and in a sense, experience loss. Many of you had to give up a senior year in high school and some of you had to give up a senior year in college. And some of you have given up uh, the kind of experience that you've wanted to have certainly through this last fall. And you've had to experience Zoom fatigue, which we've all been a uh, part of. But your energy and enthusiasm is something that we're forever grateful for. The, the work that you see before you is our calling, calling of giving a, an education experience at John Carroll University. And your presence with us is a gift that renews our hope for this world. So I want you to know that, that we're grateful for your presence with us both tonight and for the coming weeks. Thank you all. On a note of excitement, we're really looking forward to hearing you back on campus with us. And I think you'll hear some of that in our presentation tonight. Whatever fashion you can join us, is going to be great. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, um, this past Saturday, some of our winter sports, athlete, sports athletes were able to move back onto campus and begin some of their, their workout and training. It has been a, a huge difference, even though there's not a large number, just to see students back on campus being with us. There have been students on and off campus in an informal way through the fall but only sort of as visiting campus and in the library to have students knowing that they're back on campus with us, they're gonna be participating uh, and we'll be with more of you coming is, is a, a great sense of relief and excitement for us all. 
Um, this will look a di uh, this semester will look a bit different, of course. Um, though in the classroom, we're going to be using the HyFlex model. There will be some in-person instruction in the classroom, while others may be zooming into the class. This will present some challenges as our faculty and our students are going to adapt to a slightly different st learning style than you've experienced in the fall. But together, we're going to get through this. We also need to stay vigilant. The virus is still a reality in our world, even though the vaccine is present now, but it's gonna be months before we can have any effect of that. Our actions will have effects that impact others beyond ourselves. So we just need to be vigilant and, um, and just pay attention to how we comport ourselves. More than anything, those who are equipped to adapt are best prepared to be successful. So these last many months, um, have been a lesson in adaptability that no textbook could have taught you. As you prepare to join us in a few uh, short weeks, less than two weeks now, uh, when we begin string, uh, spring instruction, I invite you to reflect on this question. How have I grown because of what I've lived through these past months? And how would I use this to make a difference in our world? So with that, we'd like to present to you what we've been preparing for, for you to come back in these next few days. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Steve. And, and Steve's gonna stay with us this evening for uh, any academic related questions that might come up. Um, we have a number of other leaders on campus with us tonight. Um, we have Dr. Sherry Crane, who's the Interim Vice Provost for Student Affairs and our Dean of Students. We have Lisa Brown Cornelius, who's the Senior Director of Residence Life, and many of you have uh, submitted questions about what the residential experience looks like uh, this semester. She's going to be happy to answer those. And we also have Gary Hominy, who's our Director of Risk Assessment and Regulatory Affairs, uh, and I'd like Gary uh, to kick things off now with our agenda. Thank you and uh, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, as we turn our attention to the spring semester, I think it's important to revisit the fall semester and all of the enhancements that we made uh, to the campus in light of the COVID-19. Uh, our spring semester really builds on this foundation. So um, I'm gonna just kind of briefly go through uh, the things that we already have in place for your return. Um, First off, we have signage. We have signage about wearing a mask, physical distancing, uh, informational signage about COVID uh, across campus. We have floor markings in front of service counters and areas where uh, people will be queuing uh, in front of uh, elevators, for example. Uh, we have PPE now, masks, face shields, hand sanitizer. Uh, we have hand sanitizer now uh, installed at every main entrance of every building and then throughout the building. We have reduced occupancy on campus. That includes classrooms, labs, conference rooms, lounges. All of them have reduced occupancy and the occupancy is posted on the room uh, along with the room layout. We have some HVAC modifications. Uh, we have uh, increased all, where applicable or possible, we um, increased all of our um, filters to MERV 15 filters. Uh, that's a hospital grade air filter for our HVAC units. Uh, we've also increased the frequency of uh, filter replacements. Uh, we have an enhanced cleaning scope now. Uh, in addition to our regular cleaning, we've increased the frequency of cleaning, the cleaning of uh, touch points, high touch points. We also are using now an EPA approved viricide uh, on a campus. And then additionally, our cleaning vendor, ABM, they have a specially trained and certified cleaning team that can come in and clean an area that has been uh, contaminated with uh, the virus. Uh, they have special equipment like these electrostatic uh, precipitators that they use to disperse uh, the chemicals in the room. And you can almost think of it as like fogging an area. And this will be used obviously in places like our 
uh, isolation in quarantine rooms. Be, it could be used all across campus uh, in uh, our uh, athletic facilities uh, as well. Classroom technology upgrades. We spent over a million dollars in classroom technology upgrades just to increase the functionality uh, of the high flex model. So the experience of the student in the room is enhanced along with the experience of the student who may be taking it, uh, the class remotely. Res Life, uh, they've uh, made changes in occupancy and protocols. Uh, you know, we've offered single rooms and there are new protocols in the residence hall such as areas where you have to wear a mask and where you don't need to wear a mask and uh, restrictions on visitors and things like that. So those are all in place. The campus in general now has, we've created interim, you know, COVID policies. And then there's the PCR testing and many of you I'm sure are familiar with that from uh, the fall. Uh, we were, um, we had partnered with Quest at that time and we had done some testing remotely at home through telemedicine and we did some testing here on campus and I think our, our experience was that was was a little mixed uh, but we're going to talk more about our testing in just a moment and also our contact tracing we're going to expand on that again in just a moment but in the fall we were really just putting together our program and figuring some things out and uh, again we'll uh, touch base on that uh, in, in just a moment so here are just um, some examples of some of the signage that we have uh, across campus. Again, some of them are just informational, some of them identifying the hand sanitizers, the physical distancing, and on every door leading into every building, there's a wear a mask sign. So we've also, this uh, will be new to a lot of people. We also have some directional signage uh, throughout the buildings. And again, this is only the buildings that really lent themselves to this kind of a traffic flow. Uh, so we have signs now, you know, designating certain stairwells as down only, others as up only. Uh, certain doors are just now gonna be exits only and others will be entrance only. And this way, we can help uh, reduce the amount of contact that we have as we pass each other in hallways and we move about on campus. Here's an example of our uh, classroom de-densification. This is AD25. Uh, you can see it originally had 37 seats in it. It's been reduced down to 12 seats so that we can maintain the physical distancing uh, needed. If you take a closer look at this picture on the right, you can see that there's little squares on the floor and the leg of the chair that's in that square has another little blue tag on it. This way, we know how the room is to be set up. If it gets disturbed uh, through the class or maybe through cleaning, we can readily reassemble the room and put it back to the proper position so that we can maintain physical distancing. Uh, the occupancy and seating uh, will be posted in the room. And again, we did this for classrooms, labs, elevators, meeting rooms, lounges, all across campus. So um, some of our conference rooms and meeting rooms now have been turned over for use with, uh, for student use. I take a look at the LSC conference room, for example. Again, we have these lay these um, layouts posted in the room and marked on the floor. Uh, if you look at the LSC one, and you see on the right, we we have different types of layouts in the in the same room. Where this one is more of like a meeting setup. If you look to the center of the room, it's more of a one-on-one -on -one with people facing each other except remember all of this is set up that we still maintain physical distancing and people will be wearing masks and again on the far left hand side there's even some you know individual seating if you're just going to go over there and study or uh, just want some uh, alone time so 
so with that, uh, let's look at the spring 2021, uh, some of our additional plans and where we've gone. So this, a big change is our spring 2021 testing plan. It'll be totally different than what you experienced in the fall. Uh, we here have a picture of our provost and academic vice president taking one for the team and leading by example here with uh, taking his uh, COVID test. But our um, our program this spring, we really we have two new partners. Uh, we are now partnered with uh, Core Bio Labs in Metro Ohio. Uh, they will be doing our PCR tests. And this is exciting because their turnaround time is 24 to 48 hours. And uh, if you remember in the fall with Quest, uh, it was three to five days for us to get our results back. So this is a big improvement uh, and they've been a very good uh, partner. Another partner is Inspired Diagnostics. Uh, we partnered with them and we purchased um, over 20,000 uh, rapid antigen tests. So these are the tests where we can get results back in 10 minutes. These tests have a negative percent agreement of 100% and a positive percent agreement of 88%. I think you've got more, sometimes you may have heard of this referred to as, oh, there's a 12% false positive rate with these tests. Uh, we have taken that uh, into account uh, in our testing program, which you'll see uh, in a minute. When we think about our, the testing program, there's really four elements to it. We have our return to campus testing, which you will experience shortly. And then we're going to have ongoing surveillance testing. There will be athletic testing. And then there will be uh, Easter break testing. And I'm going to walk you through each one of these uh, different elements. So let's look at the return to campus testing. Um, this testing is going to be conducted in the intramural gym. I see a picture of a little layout. There'll be a few more chairs added by the time you arrive. But this testing is going on for basically four groups of people. We have our athletes, which we've mentioned they're already kind of gone through this testing. They've already started to return. We have our uh, undergraduates, particularly our uh, residential students, our graduate students, and our faculty and staff. All of these groups are included in our uh, return to campus testing. Uh, let's go through the process for uh, when you come back to, uh, to move in. When you arrive for move in, you're going to come directly to the IM gym. And you are going to receive a, uh, a rapid antigen test. We, when you, you'll get swabbed, and you'll take a chair and wait for 10 minutes, and we'll have the results. If the results are negative, you can continue on with the move in process, and you will be tested again in approximately five to seven days. If you should test positive, we'll move you off to the side and you will be contacted by a nurse or one of our contact tracers. They will ask you some questions and we're going to try to determine if, you know, were you symptomatic when you came here that, you know, oh gosh, you know, I did have some sniffles or I did have a headache or I had some symptom or, or Maybe you say, oh, you know what? I was in close contact with someone who tested positive for COVID. If that's the case, we are going to assume that the rapid test is accurate. And if you're local, so within um, 150 miles, uh, we're going to ask you to go home and isolate at home. If you're not local, uh, you're greater than 250 miles. Um, we will move you into one of our isolation rooms. Now, there's another scenario that could happen here where somebody gets a positive test and they say, wow, I'm asymptomatic. I have no symptoms. I feel great. 
And I haven't been around anybody who has tested positive recently for COVID. In that case, we will give you right then and there a PCR test and you will move into one of our isolation rooms. See, this is the beauty of our, our quick turnaround time that we'll have with our PCR test, because if it is a false positive, you would only remain in the um, isolation area for uh, 24 to 48 hours. So we can have a quicker turnaround to get people out of isolation if indeed it is a false positive. So that's our returning to campus testing. Our other element of testing will be our ongoing surveillance surveillance testing. This is going to be going on for, uh, you know, we're going to be doing this for our undergrad, our graduates, and our faculty and staff. Uh, in the picture here, you can see we're going to be conducting this testing in the Jardine room. Now, we're testing 3% of this population the, of the undergrad, graduate, and faculty and staff, 3% a week. Uh, now, some people have asked me, uh, you know, wow, how did you come up with 3%? Is that uh, enough? And well, the 3% came from the governor of Ohio who uh, recommended 3%. But we took our plan to Metro Health, our entire testing plan, and I gave it to them and asked them to just look it over and give us our, their thoughts. And actually, you know, they thought it was a very robust plan. Um, they, when asked about the 3%, they felt that that was sufficient to kind of uh, survey our, our population. But they said, you know what, you should be prepared to test clusters or hotspots that might develop on campus. Like, for example, maybe a, um, you know, a floor or a whole residence hall, for example. What if we needed to, you know, just do a quick test on them? And indeed, we built enough uh, tests into our uh, our program that we would be able to do that to, to test uh, any hotspots or clusters. Uh, I want to also mention here that the uh, athletes, you'll notice, are not included in the surveillance testing. And we're going to go over that in just a minute. And uh, you'll see that our athletes really get a, uh, you know, have had a large amount of testing done on our athletes. So here is our athletic uh, testing. Now, really, the, 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 the real takeaway I want from this slide, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but we have all the, the sports over on the left-hand side that show that needed, or the NCAA requires some testing. We're required to give a test in the preseason once a week to the athletes. When they're in season, we need to test them three times a week. So if you look at the far right of this chart, you can just see all the tests that we are administering to our student athletes. That's over 16,000 tests right there for the spring semester. Uh, and so that's why you know, we decided not to include them in our uh, surveillance testing for the rest of the population. And lastly, we'll talk about our Easter break testing. Uh, we proposed to do some pre-Easter break testing and post-Easter break testing, basically focusing on our residential students. And we we're looking at testing uh, approximately 25% of them. Now, um, I will say that's not written in stone. We would have enough tests that we could increase that number quite a bit. Um, but right now, that's what we're anticipating, that we will offer pre-Easter and post-Easter testing uh, to our resident students at about 25%. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Lisa and she can talk about her on-campus uh, residential experience. Thanks, Gary, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, as has been indicated, I want to share a little bit with you about the on-campus residential experience. Um, as we prioritize health and safety in this time, we are committed to an engaging residential experience. So all of our 
protocols and changes are focused on the health and safety, but we also want the residential experience to be one where students develop meaningful relationships, learn a lot about themselves and others, and really develop memories that are gonna be impacted obviously by living through the COVID um, pandemic, but also that really re resonate with them as during their time in John Carroll. Um, we have reduced the overall density in the residence halls. So as you move on to campus, you'll notice that some spaces it, on your floor or in your community may not be occupied because we are cognizant of trying to have students living together, but reduce that density in those locations um, for, so that we can maintain distancing and um, reduced occupancy. Students have been offered through um, in August and then throughout this first semester, the opportunity to opt into a single occupancy room. And we have honored all of those requests um, that have come forward. We've also implemented interim policies that prioritize health and safety. For all residential students, you've been asked to review and acknowledge those interim policies through your housing portal. So if you haven't done that already, please make sure you do that before you arrive to campus to move in. But those policies talk about where masks are required, um, that masks are required in all common areas. Um, and the only time you can you do not have to have a mask on is, is when you are in your room, either by yourself or with your roommate. If you have a guest in your room, you will need everyone will need to be masked. It also has um, our policies also include requirements about guests. We are not permitting any overnight guests, and we are limiting guests in the residence halls to only those affiliated with John Carroll. So we know that that's a challenging um, uh, interim policy, but we're doing it because we want to prioritize the health and safety of our students. And we know that introducing members um, to the community that are not um, in the John Carroll bubble, so to speak, um, increases the opportunity for the virus to spread. And so our priority is on the health and safety of our students. We've also um, increased cleaning protocols and we'll be cleaning the residence halls and the, re and the community bathrooms multiple times a day with those enhanced cleaning protocols and um, staff that um, have been mentioned earlier. Throughout all, all of this though, um, our staff has been working on the ways in which students can get to know each other and develop community with each other in physically distanced and responsible ways, but still fun. And so as students return to the residence halls, DRAs will be, you know, having programs and activities that allow them to get to meet the other folks with whom they're living, get to know more about John Carroll, but do so in a way that makes sure that the health and safety is our top priority. As those of you who are residential students know, our move-in process is planned for January 10th through the 21st. Um, all of you have um, been signing up for a specific time to come to campus to do your return to campus testing. And then you will begin your two hour move in period once your testing has been completed. Um, we know that the requirements for um, testing and then the, you know, the limited number of individuals who can come to campus to help you move in as well as the, the limited time frame um, is challenging, but we appreciate your partnership because we want to, again, have everyone have a positive experience while maintaining the focus on health and safety. Um, and then finally, after you've moved on to campus, um, you've received your negative COVID test, um, we ask you to plan to stay on campus. There are gonna be activities that are gonna be happening starting January 10th through the beginning of classes um, throughout the days and then once classes begin. And so we really want you to stay on campus because we know that um, by staying on campus and reducing your um, exposure to others outside of John Carroll, um, we want to protect our, our campus community from spread as well as us potentially impacting the community outside of John Carroll. And then finally, as um, Gary indicated before, for those of you who may have a positive test, we will go through the protocols that have been outlined in our testing program. But if you um, do need, are positive and do need to return home, um, if you live within four hours of campus, we will ask you to return home to isolate for your isolation period. If you are from beyond that four hours, we will um, offer you isolation on campus and we'll support you through that process. Another piece that has been a really key priority for us as we have thought about the spring semester is what the dining experience will look like. 
Um, we know that um, as we look at the research and what folks are sharing nationally and locally, um, that when folks are not wearing masks, often when they are dining, that that is an opportunity for virus spread. So in working with Parkhurst, our dining partner, um, we have made the decision that dining will be takeout only through at least February 1st. And we're doing this as a way to get folks on campus, allow folks to enjoy our um, dining facilities, but to minimize the opportunity for spread. We will be evaluating that decision um, as we look at what is happening on our campus, what uh, other guidelines are available, and determining do we open limited occupancy in-person eating throughout the semester. So that will be something that will likely change, but at least in through February 1st, all dining will be takeout only. That being said, we will have identified, we have identified locations on campus for students to eat. It will allow them to not have to feel like they have to return to their residence hall room to eat all meals, um, but they will be able to, there are locations on campus, one of them being the LSC room, which Gary um, showed um, in what his room layouts um, picture. There will be a space where students can go eat um, and there will be other folks there. So they need to be aware that there will be other individuals perhaps without masks on, um, but they, they can do so physically distant so that they're not feeling like the only place they can eat is in their residence hall room. We will, for those of you who are moving in that first day on January 10th, uh, meal plans will be active starting with dinner that evening. So, um, and you will be able to access the dining facilities that week. Um, because students will be um, moving onto campus in smaller number or numbers each day, the facilities will open up throughout the week, but the, so you will be able to experience all the different dining facilities um, moving forward and the ways in which they have set up um, ways to get your takeout meals and then um, be moved through conveniently. One thing that I can share with you, and this is probably more um, relevant for some of our returning students is that the students who are on campus so far have given rave reviews to Parkhurst and the food that they're providing. So even though the dining experience is not the social experience that we all hope it is, um, we're hearing amazing things about the good food that Parkhurst is providing. So for those of you new, you're gonna be welcome to that. But for those of you who are returning, that'll be hopefully an exciting new taste. You've heard lots, um, have probably received lots of communication about the campus clear up as well as um, we're gonna talk about it a little bit later in the presentation. But this, the dining facilities are one location where you need to be prepared to show your campus clear app that indicates that you don't have any symptoms and you've been cleared to move about campus that day. So if you're not already in that practice of um, engaging with the campus clear, clear app daily, please begin to do so because you will be required to show it every when you enter the dining hall. And then finally, Parkhurst, our partner in dining, has been working very hard on specific protocols and ways in which you will engage in the dining experience that are safe. So I encourage you, if you don't already, to follow Parkhurst on social media because they've been pushing out a lot of information through specifically their Instagram. It talks about um, the ways in which you can navigate the dining hall or the protocols that are in place. And so while there's going to be many emails that are me coming to your inboxes over the next couple of days, um, so the social media access might be a good way to kind of see what that experience is going to look like if you have questions. So I know that the quarantine and isolation process has, um, a, there are a lot of questions. And so I'm going to do my best to give a broad overview and to respond to some of the general questions that we've received prior to the webinar. Um, but because I know that this is a process that is stressful and somewhat daunting for, for students and their families. So just to differentiate for quarantine versus isolation, if we are asking you to quarantine, that means that you have been identified as a close contact and we're using the definitions of um, determined provided by the CDC that indicate that you've been a close contact, which typically is you've been in close contact for 15 minutes or longer, um, typically without wearing a mask. So that extra layer of protection is on. And so if we identify you as a close, if you're identified as a close contact of someone who has tested positive, we will, you will be asked to enter quarantine. Isolation is when you have tested positive for the virus. So that may happen on your return to campus testing, 
your student athlete. It may happen through your ongoing student athlete testing. It could happen if you're um, chosen to be part of the surveillance testing, or if you begin to experience symptoms common to COVID-19 and you contact the health center um, and have a test there and are told and test positive. So that testing, that positive test may come about through many different ways. But if you are test positive, you will be asked to isolate for the 10 day period um, for the isolation. And that again, we are following the CDC guidelines related to that. If you are a residential student, and I wanna make a distinction here um, that the process I am uh, sharing right now is for students who are living on campus. Um, if you're a student who lives off campus, the health center is here to support you as well and will be your go-to place if you have questions about your symptoms and may need testing because you're symptomatic. And so this health center will support you and if contact tracing is needed, they will also be, um, the contact tracers will work with you. But know that the process that I'm about to describe is for residential students. So we have taken, um, based on what we have learned and how we're anticipating um, being able to support students in quarantine and isolation, we have taken Dolan Residence Hall offline for the spring semester for quarantine and isolation space. We have designated in that building different spaces for quarantine and isolation, and they are not together. They are on different floors. So that if someone is positive, they are not on the same floor as someone who is um, in quarantine. We also have a small isolated wing in Murphy Hall that is close to the health center that we've designated as isolation space as well. So from where we were in August, we have more than tripled the amount of quarantine and isolation space we have available to, um, to support students through this semester. If a student needs to be placed in quarantine or isolation, um, we will talk them through that process. We will provide them with resources. Our staff has been trained um, to work with students and ha have the resources available to support students in quarantine and isolation. Many of you, especially those of you who are residential students, received an email with a link to the quarantine website, quarantine and isolation website that has been developed. The, the details from, the, from things that you need to think about before you come to campus to what is in your quarantine room, the things that you need to think about that you would take to quarantine or isolation with you. Um, so I encourage you, if you and your families and those who are important to you to take a look at that website um, because it answers a lot of the questions um, that we think are common about the quarantine and isolation process so that you are most prepared um, because we know that the quarantine process is stressful. And so we want folks to be most prepared. Be prepared. While you are in quarantine or isolation, you will be asked to stay in your quarantine or isolation room unless you are seeking medical care as directed by the health center. So because of that, you will not be able to move about campus, go pick up your meals and, or your packages in the meal, mail center. We will deliver all three meals to you daily. So you will have the opportunity to order what you want and those will be delivered um, you know, kind of a, around eight, noon, and six, so kind of in those typical meal periods, but those will be delivered directly to you. We will also be monitoring for those of you who are in quarantine and isolation, um, and if packages are, you know, if someone wants to send you a care package, or if you've ordered a book from Amazon and it arrives at the mail center, we're coordinating with our colleagues in the mail center to have those packages delivered to the quarantine and isolation spaces. So we're, we have processes and plans to support you so that while you're in quarantine and isolation, we know that it's a, a very lonely experience, but we're working to make sure that you're supported and have what you need to get through that time period. So as you're preparing to move on to campus, there's a couple of things that I want to remind you about. Um, we are asking all residential students to talk with their parents, family members, and those who support them about what your quarantine or isolation plan is. We are prepared to support residential students who need to go into quarantine and isolation. So we, we have the resources, we have the staff, we have the plan. But we also know that some students may prefer to quarantine or isolate at home. We want you to have that conversation before you come to campus so that you kind of have an idea of what your decision is gonna be so that you're not trying to make that decision at a time of stress when we're asking, when we're telling you that this, you need to 
you know, move into this location. Where if you are able to, um, when you make that plan, you need to think, there's some questions on the quarantine website that we ask you to think about, about, you know, are you able to, if you choose to return home, can you do that safely? Are you able to isolate from the other folks who may be in the house with you? Um, are you able to return to your um, home or location that you choose to quarantine off campus via personal vehicle or car versus, you know, flying or things like that? So we really want you to think about what that plan is before you move on to campus. The other thing that we really highly encourage you to do is pack a quarantine bag. And there is a list of um, suggested items to include in that quarantine bag on the quarantine website. Um, I'll be honest, we've had to move some students into quarantine already based on um, our return to campus testing. Um, and so the students who, um, who had a quarantine bag packed, a stressful process was made a little bit less stressful because they were able to grab their quarantine bag, get their book bag and their pillow and move into quarantine fairly easily. So I encourage you to take a look at that quarantine bag and think about how you can pack that. So if it does come to pass that you need to be moved into quarantine, you're able to easily do so again during a stressful situation. If you're not already doing so, begin to use the Campus Clear app daily and do your daily symptom assessment. And then if you live in a state on Ohio's travel advisory list, we communication was sent to all residential students prior to the winter, ho winter holiday break. Um, you are encouraged to self-quarantine prior to returning to campus. Um, we believe that our testing program and both the testing before we allow you to move into the residence halls and then the follow-up testing five to seven days later allows us to make sure that we are going to have a safe um, and be able to recognize where we are with the virus and make sure that we are focused on that health and safety um, in our residential community. But we need your partnership in that. So as you're, if you are coming from one of those states that Ohio has identified um, as, as a travel advisory, we are strongly encouraging you to self-quarantine as much as possible prior to returning to campus. And then um, know that as we move into the next couple of days, as we get closer to January 10th, when move-in begins, um, there's gonna be consistent updates from Residence Life and other campus offices about um, the move-in process. So we just want you to be prepared. So please continue to check your John Carroll email consistently. And at this point, I think I'm going to turn it over to Sherry to talk about contact tracing. Thank you, Lisa. And again, I just want to offer my welcome to everyone and, and thank you for joining us tonight for this webinar. So I just have a few slides. I'll talk a little bit about contact tracing and I want to talk about what campus life will look at during the upcoming spring semester. Um, so this first slide is just a note to let you know that about 30 of our staff members have been trained so that they can conduct contact tracing. Uh, as many of you have heard of Johns Hopkins University, they put together about a six or seven hour online course to train people to do contact tracing. And so our 30 staff have all completed the Johns Hopkins course. We have staff from a whole variety of departments, athletics, human resources, res life, our police department, health and wellness, academic advising, recreation, and student engagement. So our ability to do contact tracing is very important as part of the whole process of if a student tests positive or an employee tests positive, understanding who they may be, have come in contact with so that we would know who might need to quarantine. Uh, thank you, Gary. The next slide is about our COVID-19 dashboard information. Uh, many of you may be aware that in the fall, we started our dashboard, which has been updated weekly with information about positive tests. And so we will continue to update the dashboard for spring semester. With our return to campus testing, we will start new data points for the spring. And uh, Gary has gone ahead and pulled up our dashboard just so you can take a look at this. Uh, we will give information with return to campus testing, what our positivity rates are, but we also will provide a comprehensive look at what our fall testing and add that on to our spring testing. 
so you can see this our COVID dashboard was last updated on December 17th and obviously we've been on break so we will provide another update by the end of this week okay thanks Gary Uh, our next slide is about reporting cases and symptoms. I know that some of you are thinking, are they going to keep talking about Campus Clear? We've already heard about this. Um, the reason we continue to want to make sure that students understand the importance of downloading the Campus Clear app is because we really don't want you to come to camp. If you live off campus, we don't want you to come to campus if you are symptomatic. If you live in a residence hall and you develop symptoms, we want you to let us know or let the health center know immediately. And we want you to use the app. We implemented use of the app probably back in August. And uh, we have offered testing programs in the fall, um, a Thanksgiving testing program and a a testing program in December. And we did find that some off-campus students had not downloaded the app, yet, app at that point. So please download the app within the next day or two if you haven't already done so. So let's talk about what campus will look like for spring semester. So I suspect most of you know that our Athletic teams, as we have mentioned, our winter sport athletes have already returned to campus. Our other athletes will be returning starting on January 10th. Um, so we're proceeding ahead in our Ohio Athletic Conference. Our student activities for the spring will be a combination, both in-person and virtual activities. We will continue to do a combination for all of spring semester. But to just give you some examples of events that we will have, we will do trivia night, we will have bingo, we'll have a hypnotist, and we will be having a welcome back concert. Our student programming board will be meeting within the next week to develop a whole semester's worth of events. So I know Lisa has talked about be sure to check your, you know, your email. And I would just like to echo that as well, because a lot of this information about events happening on campus uh, will be shared with you either through social media or through your email. Uh, next on our list about what will campus look like, our offices will be opened and staff. We do have some staff who may continue to work remotely, uh, but we want you to know that offices are open. So for example, this, the health center has been open uh, just about the entire time since the pandemic started, except for when the governor uh, closed down the state. Uh, but they are open, they're available by appointment, so you can just contact them. Lisa talked a, a little earlier about food service. Um, those of us who work on campus sometimes frequent Einstein's Bagels for a cup of coffee. We're very excited that they will be reopening uh, for takeout only uh, on Tuesday, January 19th. Some good news if you're bringing a car to campus, our first and second year students in the past have needed to park at the Green Road Annex, but for this spring semester, all students will be allowed to park on main campus. Um, we won't need to use Green Road Annex for this semester. And the last bullet point that I just want you to be aware of, um, in the state of Ohio, there is currently a curfew that exists from 10 p.m. until 5 a.m. Uh, the governor has currently put that into place until January 23rd. That curfew may get extended and we will certainly update our campus community as that information becomes available. I do want you to be aware of spring recreation opportunities. So the facilities that are available are Corbo Fitness Center, which had a big renovation uh, and looks beautiful. We have a fitness studio, the IM fitness studio, there's the IM gym, our natatorium. You will have access to these facilities. It will require an online reservation and we will limit the amount of time a student um, can use each space, which will be between 30 and 60 minutes. Um, you will need to wear a mask, um, but I suspect that for some of you, as you've been at home, if you've gone to a gym in your home community, these are pretty typical protocols that other gyms have put into place or other fitness facilities that they've put into place. 
the hours starting January 19th, our, the normal hours will begin for our, our COVID. Corbo Center. So Monday through Friday, they're open from seven in the morning till 10 at night. And then on the weekends, they're open from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, intramural sports, uh, that information will be available very soon, but intramural sports begin the week of January 25th. And group fitness also begins the week of January 25th. So um, we encourage you to stay healthy and to be active during the spring semester. I know you're all wondering where you can study. And so library hours for spring semester are the same as the fall. S Sunday, again, 11 a.m. till midnight. Monday through Friday, Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to midnight. Friday, they close at 10 p.m. And Saturday, they're open from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. So um, plenty of opportunities for study space in our library. We encourage you to take advantage of it. And at this point, I will turn it back over to Mike Scanlon, who will facilitate the Q&A. Great. Thanks, Sherry. And you can see here the statue of St. Ignatius um, wearing the mask uh, that will be featured on our social media moving forward, um, just as a constant reminder of the need to wear a mask on campus. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists this evening. We covered a lot of ground. Uh, there are a number of questions here. Uh, we'll do our best to get to as many as we can uh, before seven o'clock. And if we need to go a bit longer, that's no problem too. Uh, the first one for St uh, Dr. Herbert um, related to the high flex model, uh, asking for clarification on how students would know whether they might be in the classroom or whether they might need to be online for a specific class and how the rotation would work if there are more students in a class than the classroom would fit. Yeah, that's information that will be communicated to you directly from your professors via the Canvas uh, course page. Um, for some classes, some professors are doing remote instruction, uh, continuing remote instruction. We have about, um, about 30, a little bit over 30% of our professors will be delivering their courses that way. Um, and the rest will be a version of what we call high flex. That is some in person, depending on the capacity of the classroom, some in person and some joining the class via Zoom. And then the rotation will depend on uh, the, the population of students in that classroom, how many and what type. About 35% uh, of our students have elected to be either remote or online only. Um, and so some students are, choose to not be in the classroom and we're of course take that into account as we figure out the rotation. The, the list of those students have been given to the professors that's updated daily or weekly, I should say. And so by the time classes start on your course page, you should start seeing information about when your schedule is, uh, whether you're gonna be uh, in person that day or remote that day, depending on the classroom capacity. That's as much clarity I can, as I can give you. Um, most of that uh, decision hand, uh, sits in the hands of the professor. Thank you, Steve. Uh, a question regarding commuters uh, and whether they are eligible to be tested asymptomatically. Mike, I can, t I can answer that. Yes, commuters who are interested in being tested, we would certainly offer them the opportunity for asymptomatic testing. And we will provide more information as we get to the start of the semester about how that testing will take place. Thanks, Sherry. A um, uh, question asking for more information about what might be included or provided in quarantine or isolation rooms beyond what the student is able to bring themselves. I uh, guess for the yes. Um, so the rooms will have linens um, and towels. Um, there will be some limited toiletries in the room. Each room will also have um, cleaning supplies. So it will include a small bottle of viricide and a cleaning cloth so that students can clean the room if they um, want to while they're in it. Obviously all rooms will be clean prior to their arrival. Um, all of the isolation rooms will have a HEPA filtration system in the room. And so there will be instructions for the students to um, operate those. Um, in addition, we have designated space in each of, in both the isolation locations and quarantine locations 
that are, we're calling them supply rooms, but those rooms have some additional items in them should students forget to bring them or find that they need them while they are um, in quarantine or isolation. There is a refrigerator that will be stocked with additional beverages, um, sports drinks, water, things like that. Um, there will be some extra snacks to supplement um, in between meal times. There'll also be things like toothpaste and toothbrushes, feminine hygiene products, things like that, that might be something that you don't think of right away when you're preparing to go into quarantine or isolation, but may find that you need. And so we wanna have that easily accessible to students. Um, in all in those supply rooms, there's specific protocols for entering the space and there's only one person allowed and things like that, but we wanna make sure that students had access to any additional resources that they might need. Again, that information about what is included in the rooms um, is located on the quarantine and isolation website. Great, thanks, Lisa. Uh, another one for you, Lisa, uh, a question about whether parents are permitted to help students move into the rooms, meaning can parents go into the residence halls okay. during the move-in period? Sure. So each student is permitted to bring two individuals to assist them during move-in. So once the student has received their negative COVID test, they'll be permitted to move in and they'll be able to have two um, individuals move, help them move in. So that can be their parents, it could be friends, um, but it will be two, students will be limited to two individuals um, per student moving in. Um, those individuals will not be tested, but they will be required to wear a mask um, and to sanitize their hands often um, and maintain physical distancing while in the building. We've also asked that um, roommates talk with each other so that um, roommates are not moving at the same time, again, to limit the number of individuals in the room while move-in is happening. So um, parents can come if you're part of the two um, individuals that your student identifies to help them move on to campus. Great, thanks, Lisa. Keep your microphone open. There's a few more for you here. Um, for uh, students asking um, if they want to go home during the semester and leave the residence halls, are they permitted to do so? Great question, thank you. Um, we are not at this point limiting any movement on or off campus. What we are asking students to think about as they make their decisions about staying on or off campus is that their decisions impact their residential community and perhaps their home community. So we know that um, we want to mitigate the spread of the virus in both communities. So as you're making a decision to move, leave campus, um, are you taking precautions in traveling there? Are you able to take precautions to protect your family members or those you're going to visit? The same is true when you return to campus. Um, precautions returning to your visit, uh, re traveling back to campus, but then who are you going to be exposed to while you're away and how might that then affect um, those that you're living with in community when you come back to campus. So we're not limiting you from leaving campus. We're just asking you to be mindful of the decision that you're making and think about how your decision is impacting those with whom you're gonna come in contact. Thanks. Uh, an additional question about quarantine and isolation and whether medical personnel will be available to students who are in those rooms. Great. Good. Another great question, thank you. Um, so our health center, um, our licensed medical professionals will be checking in with all of the students who are in quarantine and isolation um, daily. And so they will also be um, doing daily symptom assessments with the students to see are things um, changing while they're in quarantine. Students will also have access to our John Carroll Police Department 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and that number is posted very broad, very boldly in the quarantine and isolation rooms, should their symptoms begin to worsen or if they feel like they need emergency help. And our JCU, our John Carroll Police Department will be able to contact um, emergency medical personnel, our University Heights Police Department and Fire Department. So they will have um, resources and folks who are available 24 seven to assist them, um, as well as just daily check-ins from the health center um, while they're in quarantine and isolation. Great, thanks, Lisa. We'll give you a break here and go to Sherry. Uh, Sherry, uh, a parent asking what sort of consequences would come to students who might be caught without masks on or uh, not observing social or physical distancing or violating other COVID protocols. Is there a process for uh, consequences for those students? 
Um, the short answer is yes, there is a process. We will be using the student conduct process um, for situations in which students, um, if there is a pattern of students not uh, abiding by our expectations, um, certainly we want to be reasonable. Um, so, you know, each of us, I think sometimes we might forget to put our mask on, but if we see repeated behavior with a student, we, we have the ability to address that through our conduct process. Great, thanks, Sherry. Um, uh, several questions um, regarding, uh, and this is for Sherry or Gary, uh, students who may have tested positive within the last 60 to 90 days, uh, asking for clarification on whether they must be tested again to move in, realizing that some uh, have been told not to be tested within several months of a positive test. Uh, Mike, I can take that. Um, we do understand that students may have already had the virus and, and had the test. What we're asking students to do is to scan or share that information and provide it to our student health center so that the student health center keeps that as a medical record for a student. And that way, when we go to move stu students in starting on January 10th, um, Lisa and her staff are aware that we already have documentation that a student has already tested positive for the virus. So a number of students have already uh, scanned or faxed or emailed their document to the Student Health Center. Uh, so if you haven't done so, it's not too late. Please go ahead and do that. Great. Uh, thanks, Sherry. Uh, this one for Lisa. Um, students who might test positive or be close contacts during the semester uh, who live within 250 miles, um, are they permitted to go home uh, to quarantine or isolate or do they have to stay on campus? Good question. Um, this is why we're asking you to think about your quarantine plan before you come to campus. We will be, we are ready to support residential students um, with our quarantine and isolation places on campus, but we know that you may want to go home or to a close relative who lives close to campus. So that is your decision. Um, so if you are asked to quarantine or have to isolate, um, you can make the decision to stay on campus or to leave campus and go home. What we, what we are asking is that you don't change your mind midway through. <laughs> so if you're choosing to go home to quarantine or isolate, you need to remain off campus for the duration of your quarantine or isolation period. If you're choosing to stay on campus for your quarantine or isolation period, we're asking you to remain on campus for that period. That's why we want you to think about what you might do ahead of time so that when, we're at, when you're asked to make that decision, um, you're able to do so in a stressful situation. So we're able to support you either way. Thanks, Lisa. Another one for you regarding the dining uh, process and mm -hmm. whether students will need to pre-order meals via an app or uh, order them and take them directly from the dining hall. Both options will be available. So students, if you um, are going to eat in the dining hall, you will enter the dining hall in the main entrance, you'll swipe in, and then you'll be able to go throughout the dining hall and um, you'll be given a to-go box and you'll be able to go throughout the dining hall and make your selections of the items that you want to um, add to your to-go box or to-go boxes. If you wanna get two boxes, you can take two boxes, um, but you'll be able to make those selections and then take those out of the dining hall. We'll also be able to, for the in-between and Einstein's using the Get app, um, which if you check out uh, Parker's social media and look for an upcoming email, um, you'll be able to pre-order like you would at you know, um, Starbucks or any other location, pre-order your meal and then go to that location and pick it up. So both options will be available to students um, so that you can you know, choose which one either fits what you're interested in or um, what your schedule. Great, Lisa. Another one for you uh, regarding the process. Uh, when a student is informed they must quarantine or isolate, will they be able to return to their residence hall room to retrieve their bag, uh, or will someone need to do that on their behalf? Um, so we will give you a brief period of time, probably between 15 to 30 minutes, to go back to your room to get your item and then move to quarantine or isolation. 
What I will say, however, is if you are symptomatic um, and reach out to the health center, the health center will do a, a symptom assessment with you via phone. And they will, based on what your response to that symptom assessment, they will ask you to bring your quarantine and isolation items with you to the health center before they test you. So that's if you're symptomatic. Um, if you are asked to be quarantined and because you're a close contact, we will give you time to go back to your room and get it. So it just depends upon how you enter quarantine or isolation. But if you are asked to bring, you will be told if you need to bring your items with you for some reason. But in most cases, you will be able to return for a brief period of time to collect your items and then go into quarantine or isolation. Obviously, during all of those times, we will ask that you keep your mask on, that you limit your interactions with others, and that you um, move as quickly as possible. Again, why we're really encouraging you to think about packing that quarantine bag before you come to campus. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I've responded to a number of people directly here, but there's been several questions about uh, when parking passes would be available. Uh, an email will come out from um, the parking pass office, which is run by JCUPD this week. So please keep an eye on your inbox as we expect to have that distributed within the next 48 hours. Um, Lisa, another one regarding the residence halls, a, a two-parter, um, just a, a description of whether kitchen uh, kitchens on floors are available in any respect, whether it be for cooking or for dishwashing, and also uh, just uh, further clarification on the cleaning procedures in the bathrooms. So in the residence halls that have kitchens, they will be accessible to students. There are occupancy limits um, posted as in those areas um, to limit the number of individuals in those spaces at one time, but students will be able to wash dishes, um, cook a small meal, things like that in, those, in the residence halls where there are kitchens. Um, for the um, cleaning of the residential, the community bathrooms, um, they will be cleaned twice a day. And so the cleaning, one cleaning will be kind of the typical um, cleaning that will use the EPA approved products that Gary talked about that are specific for viricide and virus um, elimination. Um, so that will happen. And then a second cleaning will happen later in the day with the electrostatic sprayer. So uh, enhanced cleaning professional who has special training um, will enter the uh, bathrooms and will do the electrostatic spraying, which after a short period of time will eliminate any potential virus in the location. So there'll be two points of really deep um, cleaning that is focused on um, eliminating any potential virus. We have also added in all community restrooms um, wipes that students can use um, to wipe down anything that they use in the bathroom, either before or after use or both times. Um, so that's one additional layer of protection um, for students um, should they choose to engage in that. Great, thanks Lisa. Um, a question regarding religious services and whether mass and other uh, religious services will be uh, offered in person on campus during the spring semester. Uh, I can take that. Um, I can't speak for the chapel services, but I can speak to the Jesu Church. They do have in-person uh, masses weekly, daily, but you are required to wear a mask and there's physical distancing. So there is a capacity, but uh, generally speaking, you, you should be able to have access to mass if you want it. Yeah, and as a follow-up to that, we'll be sure to include uh, the specifics regarding the chapel uh, on our social media and in our uh, upcoming messages to students and parents. So thank you, Steve. Um, a question, uh, several questions about the freshman uh, first year student move in experience and whether there are additional activities or orientations uh, for those students to become aware of campus and their surroundings and to get a feel for John Carroll. Mike, I can take that. So the our, if if first year students live in the residence halls, the RAs will be working with them to provide 
physically distance campus tours to make sure that students feel comfortable with campus and our spaces on campus. For commuter students, first year commuter students, our tour guides will be offering campus tours next week, uh, January 14th and 15th, uh, late in the afternoon. And that information will be going out to first year students within the next couple of days. So those are just a couple of examples of activities or orientation that we'll provide to our first year students. Thank you. Um, a clarification on whether um, if a student tests positive or must quarantine and they want to do so at home, will family members be able to go into the residence hall to help them move their belongings out? Um, so if a student chooses to quarantine off campus at home or another location, no, they will, a family member will not be able to enter the residence hall to get items for them. Hopefully the student will be able to take the items that they need. Um, if there is additional assistance needed, um, residence life staff members will be able to assist if, you know, if that is needed, but family members will not be able to enter the halls to move them at that point. Thanks, Lisa. Um, we have quite a few more questions here, so we'll keep going for a bit. Um, and thanks to our panelists for sticking around and for our, our attendees for your patience. Um, I'm doing my best to get to all of them. Although uh, at the current list, we may not get to all of them uh, this evening. Um, next up, uh, a question on where we can access the quarantine and isolation website. Um, I will um, I will share that in the chat here, but Lisa, I, I assume you will also share that via email. Yes, so there will be an email coming to residential students tomorrow with a few reminders about move-in. And one of the things that will be included will be the quarantine and isolation website. And as has been our practice with most of the emails related to the move-in and return to campus, um, we will send a copy to the designated parent or guardian email address that the student has shared with us as the person they want us to share that information with. So that information will be coming um, likely tomorrow afternoon. Great, thanks, Lisa. Um, hold on, let me just go back to the top here to see who we've missed. Uh, a question uh, or a clarification on uh, the amount of time, the number of days a student would need to be in quarantine uh, if they're in close contact or in isolation if they test positive. Lisa, I can, I can take that. So a student would go into isolation if they're symptomatic. Um, so someone would be in isolation for a minimum of 10 days. If, one, if they have a fever and the fever has been reduced for at least 24 hours without the aid of a fever reducer like Tylenol and their symptoms have gone away, after 10 days, someone would be able to get out of isolation. With our quarantine, the CD, some of you may be aware, the CDC did revise their guidelines in early December. And so initially the guidelines for quarantine were 14 days. The CDC did revise those guidelines. So this assumes that someone is, has been exposed, but they are asymptomatic. So for example, when we test students this coming Sunday, if uh, a student were to test positive and they're asymptomatic, they would still, if they're from um, you know, 300 miles away, they would go into quarantine. We will test that student again on day five of their quarantine. If they test negative and they continue to be asymptomatic, after day seven, we would release them from quarantine. So that's hopefully that provides some clarification. Uh, based on our experience, we know that some students are asymptomatic. They get tested, they test positive. They may, we know that for individuals who develop the virus, it typically happens four to five days after they've been exposed. So that's why we're testing people 
once they're in quarantine, typically five days after exposure. Great, thanks, Sherry. Uh, clarification requested uh, regarding move-in times, whether students should arrive at that time expecting to be tested or whether that's the time they should expect to go into the halls. The time that students have signed up for is their check-in and testing time. So they will need to arrive at that time. They will do some initial check-in and have their testing. And once their testing is completed and they've received a negative test, their move-in time, their two-hour move-in time will begin at that point. Great, thanks. This one for Sherry um, regarding Ohio's uh, 10 p.m. quarantine and whether that applies to students um, walking around campus particularly those who might be coming from the library, um, which is open past 10 p.m. on several nights. So walking on campus from the library back to a residence hall is not a problem at all. The, uh, the governor instituted the 10 p.m. curfew so that um, for drinking establishments that the drinking establishments need to close at 10 p.m. But that's the general idea of why there is a curfew. Great, thank you, Sherry. Try not to uh, ask any redundant questions here. Um, for Lisa regarding um, bathrooms and suites on campus and whether those will be cleaned um, by the cleaning service or whether students are responsible for cleaning those. Thanks. So any rest, any um, residential uh, space that has a private bathroom, so whether it's a suite or it's a single with a private bathroom, um, those will not be cleaned by our cleaning staff. However, each when students move in, the each bathroom will have a bucket of cleaning supplies, including the viricide um, spray that we've mentioned that the EPA approved that our cleaning services will be using um, in other cleaning locations. So there, that spray and other cleaning supplies will be provided to students upon move in with instructions for use, but students will be responsible for cleaning their own spaces. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, a question regarding club sports and whether those will be available in the spring. So at this time, uh, students involved in club sports, I believe it is correct to say they will be able to practice, but there will not be competitions. Uh, more information will be available about club sports within the next two weeks. Great, thanks, Sherry. Steve, um, this one back to you, uh, kind of a two-parter. Um, does the decision of whether a class is an uh, in-person or online class lie completely with the professor? And is there a deadline for the professor to decide whether that class is indeed available in-person or fully remote? Uh, a, a complicated question a little bit. Um, generally speaking, yes, it is the faculty's decision. There is a process that the faculty go through to request to be able to teach remotely, uh, entirely remotely. Um, and I, I, I say remotely and not online because online assumes, in my definition, asynchronous. Um, and our, our preference and our assumption is that even if it's a remote, that there's a synchronous portion, even though maybe not every meeting period would be synchronous, synchronous via Zoom. Um, we, yes, the faculty request to be able to teach remotely and they're, they're approved at that. Um, that generally speaking, it can change, but uh, we have a number of faculty that are, are looking forward to being having students back in the classroom as, it, as is the case. Um, what can change is that faculty, uh, they have lives as themselves. They may feel bad and if they feel uh, bad or ill, um, COVID or not, we, we ask them not to come to campus. And so they, if they feel well enough, they can deliver their instruction via Zoom. So you could have the interesting situation where you have students in a classroom, but the, but the professor comes in via Zoom. Um, and that's typically gonna be temporary. That's gonna be uh, um, just on occasion. Um, the entirely remote classes, uh, they've already been notified or that should be listed that way in the course catalog. 
So those that we know of, and that's that's the bulk of them right now. Thank you, Steve. Um, Steve, this one might be for you as well. Um, the question about the combination of the Eastern spring break, why that was decided, and are we encouraging students to stay on campus? Do they have to leave? Is there any policy related to staying or going? So I, I can walk you through that. Um, I, I, won't, I won't take a long time, but um, the, the, the conversation around spring break, there are a number of institutions that have eliminated spring break and decided to power through the spring semester. Just start a little bit late, finish on time or early, and just go straight through. There are a lot of places that were in person and they tried that this fall. And we did a version of that too, even though it was remotely. It is very hard on everyone, students, faculty, staff alike. And what we wanted to do is privilege the fact that we need breaks. We need to let our brains rest for a while. So the, the prospect of having a spring break with all that implies about sort of going off, either bringing perhaps infections in our community to other communities and then bringing community infections from communities back to our community, we come was not one we looked forward to and yet we knew we needed a break. One version was to have the breaks scattered throughout the semester in individual days so that people wouldn't leave campus. What we decided was that when it comes to Easter, especially given the, the Jesuit Catholic identity of John Carroll, we were going to have an Easter break. Um, it was a good place to put it as roughly in the middle. Um, and so we decided to expand speak Easter break to a week and eliminate spring break. Uh, one of the things that does is it takes away the two weekends and we have the weekend of Easter break. And that's why we, and we also knew we were going to send students away, but likely they would be going home rather than to another venue. So that's the rationale why we centered on Easter uh, as a break rather than keep a spring break. Um, because of sending them home, we decided it was the right thing to do to offer testing both before they leave and after they come back. Um, and as you said, we settled on 25% as being, I think a reasonable number, um, but we, depending on our testing capacity, we may actually expand that depending on um, where we are is, as far as the COVID environment, how infectious uh, the surrounding communities are and, and things of that nature. So uh, that's the, uh, the thinking about why a, an Easter break and no spring break. Thank you, Steve. Um, students asking whether they are, uh, if uh, they're a student on campus, are they permitted to go into any residence halls or are only students who live in those residence halls permitted to be in the residence hall? So our, our current interim policy is that you can, if, as long as you're a John Carroll student, you can visit other John Carroll students in a different residence hall. Um, you, there are no overnight guests and no non-John Carroll guests permitted in any residence hall. But if someone lives in Campion and has a friend in Hamlin, you are able to visit them with the requirements of you're wearing a mask, you're maintaining physical distancing, um, and following those interim policies, but you are able to visit friends in other buildings. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, one second, I just, uh, we have a little backlog. Um, commuter students asking whether they are also permitted to park on campus during the spring. Yes, they are. Thank you, Sherry. Um, students asking whether they are permitted to have futons in their rooms this year. That's a really great question. Um, as part of our interim policies, we are asking that students do not bring any multiple person seating. We're doing that for two reasons. One, um, we know that that invites additional individuals into the room and each room has a specific level of occupancy that are of a loud number of guests in the room. So we are not permitting um, multiple seating items in rooms this semester. Um, that, again, this is an interim policy that does not mean it's gonna um, go forward beyond this semester, but it's one that we felt was important for um, he prioritizing health and safety. We also know that um, as we think about um, the ways in which we need to move students in in the time frame. Um, and then we anticipate a similar move out timeframe in May um, that 
large items like futons, couches, things like that um, make the process a little bit more difficult. And so again, as we prioritize health and safety, we made the decision to um, not allow futons or multiple seating items um, based on those priorities. Thank you, Lisa. Um, are commuters able to order food from the dining hall if they do not have a meal plan or do they need to find other options on campus? The commuters are able to access the dining hall. We do have, if you are interested in a meal plan, there are two commuter specific meal plans that are smaller um, meal plans than a typical residential meal plan. And those um, options are available um, off of the Residence Life website. There's some dining um, information that is available to all students, um, whether or not you live on campus. So you, you can choose to take advantage of one of those. However, if you do not have a meal plan, you can pay the door rate um, at lunch, for example, and you know, pay, um, I, don't, I apologize, I don't know the exact amount right now, but it's around $8, I think, to enter the dining hall and you can get your, you know, get as much as you want while you're in the dining hall and take that to go. So you are able to access um, and pay for things without a meal plan. Also for um, the locations like the in-between and Einstein's, using that Get app, um, you can, it, it'll connect to your meal plan if you have one, or if you would like to add a credit card, you can put a credit card in and then if you just want to order every so often, it'll charge against your credit card versus you know, if you don't have a meal plan. So there are options for commuter students, um, whether or not you choose to have a meal plan. Thanks. Um, we've just got a couple more. We've got about four minutes here. Um, and I would reiterate to those still uh, listening in that we will do our best to reply to all the ones we haven't uh, gotten to, whether we received them here or via covid-response at jcu.edu. And you can also continue to use that email address throughout uh, the semester. Those emails are routed to the appropriate departments for response. Um, this one I know has come up a, a number of times. Um, are students allowed to change their minds once the semester starts regarding being an in-person versus a virtual student? And a separate question, so that one's for Steve, and then a separate question, are they, if they change their minds and want to go virtual, are they able to move out of the residence halls and go home? So Steve, we'll start with the uh, academic side. Short answer is yes. It would be more difficult if you choose to be remote and want to move on campus or want to, to come to campus. That That's problematic. It's easier to say I'm on campus and I don't feel secure or I, I'd like to go back home and be can it be remote things can change in our lives in addition I would reiterate at any time no matter what status of your student um, you if you do not feel well you should not come to class if you feel well enough to take the class you can do it remotely that's part of the purpose of the high flex program um, but you should not come to class if you are not feeling well thanks and, and Lisa regarding the housing situation so if you would change your status and decide to declare yourself a remote student partially through the semester, um, you can be released from the housing agreement. And what that what we would do at that point is we would only charge you for the time that you lived on campus. So we gauge that from the date you check in until the date you turn in your key. And so we have a process um, through our office that would we can assist you in that um, if you make the decision to um, move to a remote student if you start in person. Great, thanks. Um, uh, several questions regarding our uh, to vaccines, whether we expect they would be available to uh, the John Carroll community at any point, and what our requirements might be uh, for students uh, regarding being vaccinated. So Sherry, I'll, I'll hand that one to you. Thanks, Mike. We do not anticipate having access to the vaccine this spring semester. Uh, based on what we've heard and based on the rollout to date. We will certainly explore opportunities if, if we get approached uh, to distribute the vaccine, we would certainly explore those opportunities, but that has not happened yet. So 
the question about will we require all students at some point in time to get the vaccine, my best answer is I don't think we're at a point with the rollout of the vaccine that we would require anything for the fall semester. We would certainly strongly encourage individuals to get the vaccine if they have the ability to do so. So in my opinion, the earliest we would be looking, if we do make the vaccine mandatory for students, we'd be looking at fall of 2022. I could follow up uh, for Sherry. Um, the, just today, the governor of the state of Ohio indicated um, the, his planning for phase two of the vaccine rollout. And in that plan is included teachers, but it, they made it very clear prioritizing K through 12 teachers, not higher education. So it, as Sherry said, it's unlikely that we'll see the vaccine certainly this semester. And uh, it's just unclear whether we'll even have enough for the fall. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, for Lisa, will there be a, a limit on, or a maximum capacity of guests allowed in a specific dorm room? Yes, so there is a maximum capacity. And if you take a look at the interim policies, it is outlined there in terms of what um, the maximum capacity is in each residence hall room. Uh, and one more regarding uh, the move-in process, Lisa. Uh, if a student tests positive um, upon move-in and they are required to isolate and they wish to do so on campus, um, what would they do with their belongings, the, all the stuff they were gonna move into their original room? So all, um, good question, thanks, Mike. Um, we will, you will be taking all of your belongings with you to your isolation space. So you will not be permitted to, nor will anyone who is assisting you be permitted to go into your permanent um, housing assignment if you have to isolate on campus from that return to campus testing. You will be taking those items with you to your isolation location. And we have a process in place, don't worry, <laughs> to make sure that we can support you in getting those items there. And then when you are able to move to your permanent assignment so that you can do that um, as easily as possible given the circumstances. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm just going through the, the rest of these here. Um, a, a question regarding uh, if a student has had COVID, but it's outside of the 90 day window. So if they were tested positive six months ago, do they still require a negative test to move in uh, to the halls? That's a good question, Mike. What, if someone ha had COVID six months ago, we would still like the documentation sent to our student health center. We will still test the student, but if the student tests positive and we know that the student, and we have documentation that the student already already had COVID, we will take that into consideration when making a decision about that student's status. Great, thank you, Sherry. Um, a question regarding uh, whether uh, we, how, or how we would react if the governor or the president or the CDC enacted significant protocols beyond those that currently exist, similar to the lockdown that we experienced uh, at, in the early part of the pandemic and whether John Carroll is prepared to deal with all the students being quarantined on campus. Steve, I'm gonna let you take this. Okay. Um, generally speaking, uh, we've lived through this before. Um, I think early on at last March, when we were dispersed to go, to go back home, that was the best thinking at the time is, let's go back home, hunker down. I think none of us quite understood uh, you know, the, the depth of uh, what this, this uh, crisis would require of us. Um, I think the thinking now is actually if there is a lockdown, so to speak, whether it's national or statewide, that the best thing is to stay in place as best you can. So um, not unlike if you recall back in the, uh, in the fall when places like Notre Dame uh, went 
and in person, and then they had this large infection, and they locked down on campus for two to three weeks to get it under control. That seemed to work. I think that's more likely the scenario that we would be uh, experiencing, where we would have enhanced protocols. We would be on campus. We would have some sort of campus life, but we would likely have not have in-person classroom instruction. Um, we would have Zoom classrooms like we'd have, but we'd have some sort of campus life um, as, as locked down as we could do here. Um, that said, it's difficult to see exactly what those national lockdown down orders might require us to do at this point. Um, so I won't make that prediction. I, I, I find it hard to believe what we know now that they that we would be in a better position for everybody to just go back to their place of origin and just stay there for you know a month or whatever it might be. I think that's the more likely scenario. Great, thanks, Steve. Um, we still have uh, 27 questions in the queue, uh, and so I'm, I'm most likely not going to get to all of them here. Um, I will uh, knock out just a few more um, before we uh, close, and then we will add additional FAQs to the website, uh, which is jcu.edu slash 2021-plan, so 2021-plan. Uh, where we will do our best to add additional information um, that's being requested tonight. Um, a question about um, athletics and why student athletes are not required to wear masks during practices. Um, I believe that's an OAC uh, rule, but Sherry, can you uh, clarify? Uh, you're, you're correct, Mike. The OAC, actually, we're following the NCAA guidance as it relates to testing and all of their recommendations. So they have not um, mandated mask wearing during practices, it is my understanding. So we're just, uh, we're certainly following the NCAA's testing protocols, which are very rigorous. Thanks, Sherry. Um, Specific to the library, will there be a limit on the number of students who are able, who are permitted to go inside the library, um, and will there be a time slot uh, situation so that everyone has proper access? There is a capacity to the library based on physical distancing requirements. There's a requirement that you have to wear masks uh, while you're inside as well. Um, I. I'm not aware that we've gotten to a point where we have to have time slots. That could happen. That is not in our planning right now. Thank you, Steve. And you need to show your campus clear app to get into the library. Good point. Uh, and I know campus clear will be required to enter uh, other areas of campus, the mail room, the copy center, I believe dining, Lisa. Um, so that's another reason to fill out the campus clear every morning. Um, Steve, for you, when would students expect to receive emails from professors uh, with more information about individual spring courses and their syllabus? Uh, I don't know that you necessarily would receive emails unless they do it through the Canvas uh, course page. All the information should be on the course pages. Some professors may have set it up so you receive email announcements uh, if you opt into that on the course page. Um, others may just post it on the course page and expect you to go see it. That, so uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't be more specific, but that's generally the way it works. Thanks, Steve. Um, a question about water fountains and refillable water stations and whether either are available to students across campus. I can answer that. Refillable water stations are available to students and employees across the campus. Water fountains are not available. Thank you, Sherry. Um, clarification requested on the curfew restrictions um, and whether JCUPD or others on campus would be monitoring students who might be arriving back to campus after 10 p.m. I'm going to give you my honest answer, which is I don't think our, our police staff will have the time to monitor students who are coming back to campus after 10 o'clock. But, but we should also understand 
it's going to take all members of our community to keep us open this spring semester. We want everybody to be safe. And so the question leads me to believe I have to ask what are students doing off campus um, and where are they off campus and what's happening off campus. Again, we want to think about how do we keep people the safest. Thank you, Sherry. Um, will dorm rooms or residence hall rooms be cleaned if a student tests positive? So would the student's room then be cleaned or sanitized in some fashion? So we are um, asking students to um, maintain their rooms. Um, we will handle any students who test positive on an individual basis in consultation with the COVID task force and our cleaning company. Thank you. Uh, will laundry or television be available in quarantine and isolation rooms? So students will be able to do laundry. Um, the laundry will be available based on a set schedule that will be shared with students if they enter quarantine or isolation. Um, television will not be available um, in indi individual televisions will not be available in the quarantine and isolation rooms, but we there is the same level of Wi-Fi in the quarantine and isolation hall as there is in any other residence hall. So students will be able to engage in their coursework if they feel um, well enough to do that. And they will be able to stream or engage in online gaming, things like that, just as they would in any other residence hall. Great, thank you. And uh, clarification on which uh, residence halls have kitchens. I don't know if that's available on the website or you know off the top of your head, Lisa. So um, the residence halls that have kitchens, Hamlin and Campion have a kitchen, as does Murphy. Um, and so for first year students, Hamlin and Campion, um, Murphy has one, as does Burnett. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, if someone requested a single room, will there only be single furniture in the room or would they have a room with extra furniture in it? So there's a um, good question. There are two different types of single occupancy options available. One is a design single, which is a room that has traditionally been a single room. So there's only one um, set of furniture. The other option is a, is a buyout room. And those buyouts are rooms that we have uh, designated this year. Um, as single occupancy, but in a typical year, they will be double occupancy. So if you um, request or are placed in a single buyout, you will be the only person in that room, but the room will have, will be a double room with double furniture. And we, when we offer the single occupancy option to students, we share that information um, as they were making decisions. So if there's additional questions, uh, my office is more than happy to talk through that with the student or their family. Thanks, Lisa. Um, regarding Easter break testing, will students be selected at random or can a student request to be tested before they leave for Easter? So we, our intention at the moment is to do random testing. However, if a student is interested in being tested, we will certainly accommodate them. That we're happy to do so. And it's important to remind you that the random testing for Easter pre and post break is at a much higher level than our surveillance testing at 3%. It's, it's right now we're envisioning the 25% level. So many more people would be, uh, we'd be randomly selected. And uh, is there any possibility that we would uh, cancel our spring break if we were worried about students um, given positivity rates or travel or quarantine needs? I would say it's very unlikely at this point. Uh, Lisa, will um, to-go or takeout boxes from the dining hall be disposable or reusable and will utensils be included? I apologize. Um, so the takeout boxes will be disposable and utensils will be provided um, and available um, when students pick their food up. 
Thanks. Another one for you, Lisa. I'm just trying to power through the rest of these. So thanks everyone for your patience. Um, if my child's roommate has decided to be remote for the spring, will a new um, roommate be placed with my child? And if not, and my child is in a single room now, will I need to pay more? So if a student's roommate has chosen to um, go remote for the spring, the remaining student will stay in their currently assigned space. Um, we cannot guarantee that a new roommate will be assigned with you. Um, however, if you remain in that room by yourself um, because your roommate has left, you will not be charged um, additionally unless you specifically say, I don't even want to be considered for a roommate and I want to keep this room as a single by myself. So if you are saying I'm open to a roommate, but we don't end up having someone to assign to you, we will not charge you additionally. If you say, I don't want, I don't want another roommate and I want to keep this room by myself, you will likely be charged additionally. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and will those takeout containers be microwavable? We're really getting into the nitty gritty here, Lisa. We are getting into the nitty gritty at this point in time. I would need to double check on that. I apologize. I'm not exactly sure what the containers look like at this point in time. Great. Okay. Um, with that, um, I, I think we can call it a night here. Um, after uh, an hour and 45 minutes, uh, we've answered 103 questions. Um, like I've said, we will do our absolute best to respond to everyone who uh, submitted one that hasn't been answered. Um, I would encourage everyone to continue checking jcu.edu forward slash 2021 dash plan. Um, as Lisa mentioned, for those living in the residence halls, the quarantine and isolation website, which is a separate URL, will be shared directly with you this week. For those who've asked about parking passes, an email is coming out this week with registration and pickup details. Um, and at any point, if you have additional questions, we continue to encourage you to email covid-response at jcu.edu. And we do our very best. We check that every day. We route those messages to the appropriate parties uh, for response. Uh, and most of all, um, as Steve mentioned at the top, we just want to express our gratitude to our students and our families, our faculty, our staff, and certainly the COVID-19 task force, um, all of whom have endured uh, an interesting nine months. I know on behalf of all the panelists, we are uh, thrilled to welcome our students back. Um, we look forward to having their energy back on campus. Um, we are taking every step we can to keep our students our staff, our faculty, our vendors, and anyone on our campus safe. Uh, and we really appreciate your attention uh, tonight, your adherence to our guidelines, um, and let's all give each other a little grace uh, throughout the semester as we navigate what's become a very challenging time in our world. Uh, just remember that the value of a John Carroll education has not changed uh, in the marketplace. And uh, we hope that you feel the same way when we get through this year. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank everybody, uh, wish you a very happy evening, and a reminder that this uh, webinar will be posted to the aforementioned webpage uh, this week. We have another one tomorrow night for uh, our third and fourth year students and grad students, so I would expect that this webinar will be posted after that one, so probably Thursday morning. Um, so again, Sherry, Lisa, Gary, Steve, Everyone behind the scenes, Shannon from IT, who you don't see but helps, helps set this up. Thank you uh, and have a great evening.